Good frosty morning. There's a light layer of frost in Farmington Hills. It finally feels like October. And this is Sunday worship, both in person and online, for Sunday, October the 24th, 2021, as we'll be thinking about how God looks on our hearts and sees what is deep within us as we uh, work to be God's people and as we struggle sometimes with ourselves. We're going to begin our time of worship with a prelude from Patricia Butler, our organist, and then our worship will commence with a stewardship message. So first, the prelude. This is stewardship time at North Church when we consider the various ministries and ways we share our time and our talents and also how we support the ministries that we undertake. And so we're alternating between presentations by some of the ministry boards about what stewardship means for the things that we do as a church and people who have a story to share about what the church means to them. And so I'd like to invite Sherelle Shand up to give a minute for stewardship. Good morning. Good morning. A few years ago, I was standing here speaking on behalf of the Shand family as to what North Congregational Church has meant to us. I spoke about how in 2004, we had been in search of a new church home. We had passed this beautiful and majestic looking church with the towering steeple on 12 Mile, and we made a pledge to stop in and see what they have to offer. We did, and I was mesmerized by the choir and the quality of the voices. Jim Wilkins was the soloist that morning, and of course you would agree with me that Jim sings like an angel. Reverend Jensen was the minister that morning, and we were greeted enthusiastically at the front door by Jerry and Karen Rusa. So if you think that greeters aren't perhaps important, or if you think it's a menial task without any direct results as a part of the worship service, just remember that Pete and I still remember their names 17 years later. Pete and I excitedly discussed on the way home how welcome we felt, and we came back the following Sunday and again and again. We love congregational worship, and North Church's mission statement included the phrase, we are gathered for worship of God and service to humanity. We felt that North Congregational Church could be a nurturing environment for Peter and myself and Matthew, who was just seven years old at the time. 
Now fast forward to the present time. The words of that mission statement are still true in 2021, and perhaps even more so now that we are dealing with the pandemic in ways that affect everyone, no matter what race, creed, or religion. Reverend Bedron's messages from the pulpit inspire us to look around and show care and compassion, compassion for those not as fortunate. Sarah and Steve Lang introduced us to one aspect of the mission work being accomplished at Crossroads Soup Kitchen, where often lunch is served to several hundred individuals, many of whom are children. The youth group from North Church often participate by helping to make numerous sandwiches and assembling hygiene kits for distribution and sorting through coats and clothing to help the clients get whatever would be useful to them. In more recent years, we have collaborated with the Muslim Community Mosque at Crossroads, and we've also visited their mosque. This, this year, we watched and cheered on a very spirited volleyball game between policemen and policewomen from Farmington, Farmington Hills, and young men and women from the mosque, followed by a delicious dinner at the dining hall, where we shared a table in conversation with families from the mosque and other members of the community. Matthew and Pete have participated in Crop Walk, which has brought together members of NCC, along with other nearby churches, who helped to raise awareness and funds to feed the hungry in the community. These are just a few reasons that North Church is important to us. Last Sunday, my heart was filled with pleasure listening to Abby Turner speak so eloquently and enthusiastically about the work of the diaconate board because she was just a few years younger than Matthew when we joined NCC, and now she's a vital member of one of the boards. I'm inspired by her commitment. And recently, Lori Rohde and Leanne Jensen spoke about Camp Restore Detroit which rehabs houses and gardens in the 9th Precinct of Detroit, an underserved community. They inspire me to want to participate in future activities. These, there are many more groups and organizations that I haven't mentioned that are as vital to the health of this church, and I'm hoping that all of us will reconsider ways of continuing to serve the Lord by service to humanity here or beyond the doors of this church. Thank you. Thank you, Sherelle. It is good to hear what the church has meant to us. And now we come together. We come to prepare ourselves for worship. We come to learn how to be good stewards of God's love. We come to offer ourselves to God, our creator. And so let us worship. Good morning. Please join me in the invocation and Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, you know us better than we know ourselves. You see in us what we may become, not how far we fall short of the goal. Come to us, fill us, transform us into your faithful people so that we may share the good news of your love with our world. We pray as Jesus taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, take the bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we will share one of our hymns for today, number 410 in the hymnal. There are hymnals in the pews. The words are in the bulletin, and we will be singing, If You But Trust in God to Guide You.
Let us pray. O oh God, we seek to be good stewards of your love, but sometimes it is challenging. We worry that we are not enough. We feel distanced from you in your perfection and our imperfection. We find ourselves struggling when we believe this should all be so easy. And so remind us, God, through the stories we have of faithful lives, the stories in the Bible, the stories that we have in the fellowship that is the church, that the life of faith is always challenging, but it is always fulfilling. And that if you intend something, you will see it done. So we can trust in you to guide us. In that trust, we open our hearts to you today in prayer. We pray, as we always do, for those Jesus entrusted to us, for the poor, for the hungry, for the homeless, for the sick, for the helpless, for the hopeless. Oh God, help us to be a salt and light. Help us to go forth with our own hands and hearts and help our resources to go even farther into your world to love and care for all your children, whoever they are, why ever they are suffering. Give us open hearts and open minds to what you are doing in this world so that we do not fall into difficult judgments instead of relying on your compassion to feed our compassion. Gracious God, we pray for your church. We pray that you will help us to be that community where we may be nurtured, where we may come and find like-minded and like-hearted people, where we may come and discover how to love and care for one another so that we may go out into the world recognizing that all the world is your kingdom, O oh God, and in all the world are our opportunities to serve. We pray for our world, for the places that are ripped by warfare, for the places that are damaged by natural disasters, for the farmers who are struggling with their crops, for all of the places where people are finding themselves struggling to survive. We pray for refugees, both from warfare and also from natural disasters, and ask that you show us how we may help them in ways that are constructive. We pray for the leaders of nations, that they may do works of peace, that they may see the work of caring for one another and healing our world as the most important work we can do. And we pray also for all of the things that we may not understand, that we may not know, the things that divide us, the ways that we make ourselves into strangers to one another, and ask you to bring us together in loving unity. Oh God, we have prayers within us that are too deep for words, and so please send your spirit upon us as we hold our hearts open to you in a moment of silence. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you hear our prayers, that you respond even when the response is, may not be what we expect. We ask you to help us to love this world and love this life, to love one another, to see the beauty all around us, especially to see your image on the faces of everyone we meet and on our own face as well. Give us the wisdom and the courage to live up to that image. Forgive us when we fall apart, when we fail in love, when we do not do our best and lift us up again and again so that we may always truly live as your blessed people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture is from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peacefully? He said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. Look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinabad and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then sent out and went to Ramah. Thus ends our reading for today. All this fall, we've been thinking about how God calls people, how God lifts people up in preparation for sending them out into the world to share the good news, to share what it is to live into God's kingdom, to begin the transformation of the world. And we're looking at this because not only all these people in the Bible are called, but we too are called by God to do the work for which God has equipped us. So, throughout the Bible there are stories of callings and the selection of the king of Israel is perhaps one of the most dramatic. It begins to point out how calling, God's calling, is a partnership and that it is important to notice from the biblical examples, especially the ones in this particular story, that God as well as people, continues to learn and to change, and to change God's own mind, not changing in love, never disrupting the covenant, but rather God learns from us about what it is to be us and draws us towards what God sees in us. Now, sometimes that works, and honestly, sometimes it does not. God, at the pleading of the people, chose Saul as the first king of Israel. God did not like this plan. He didn't love it. He said, the king is going to lord it over you. The king is going to make you go places and fight wars that you don't want to fight. Are you sure? Which is the God version of, if everybody else jumps off a bridge, will you jump off that bridge? And the people said, no, no, no. We really want a king. We want someone to be firm and strong and lead us. And so God did that. And the initial effort of that did not go well right from the start. 
God chose Saul to be the leader of the people. But Saul, when God brought forth, had Samuel bring forth all the people of Israel to lift up the choice for king, Saul was so reluctant that he hid from God. He hid from people. He hid amongst the baggage of all the people. And Samuel had to rout him out to make him king, to anoint him. And from there, it just went on downhill. Saul absolutely refused to follow God's requirements. When Saul became king, the tall, handsome man who had been chosen to lead the people, he saw this as a sign of his own excellence instead of as a sign of his own obedience to God. Finally, God gave one last test through Samuel the prophet, and Saul did not do what God asked, and God gave up on Saul and tells, as you heard, Samuel to stop grieving, stop mourning. I am going to do something new. So here we have God rejecting Saul and choosing David. David is an interesting choice. He is the youngest of seven or eight brothers, actually. He has seven brothers. And typically, they would not think that that would be the one chosen for leadership, although by now we've heard enough stories of the younger being chosen ahead of the older to know that that's how God works. David was not just the youngest. He was a musician. He was a shepherd. He was an unlikely hero. He had a heart too big for his own good. And he also very often messed up. Now, it's curious that God has bumped Saul from the throne and criticized his flaws and his mistakes and then replaces him with David because David, in his own way, is just as flawed as Saul. But Saul was not flawed in a way that God could work with. And that's the important message here. God chooses people based on what we are, all of what we are, including the bad things. And God chooses us the same way. So that's worrisome sometimes. I don't know about you. It has been for me. God looks in our heart and calls us, but are we like David or are we like Saul? Will we miss the mark and ignore God? Will we be just no good at this God mission? Or are we like David? Can God see beyond our flaws, some of them may be really big ones, as they were for David, and work with us just as God did with David? So many questions, so many questions, and not always a lot of answers. Like every single person God calls, so if you're keeping score, that's every single person, because God calls us all, we are afraid. And so we need to go ahead in our faith story this time. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is a full testimony on its own. It is complete. But for us, as followers of Jesus, I think it's important for us to move ahead to the coming of Jesus, because that is where the good news in this story resides, at least for me. Because the king and prophet relationship was flawed and was still one of dominion, It never had the same promise that God himself coming into this world would have. People got stuck in what they needed to do, and they got stuck waiting and wondering if God had forgotten them. And so in the incarnation and the coming of Jesus, God told us and showed us what we needed to do, how we needed to be. And it turns out what God has told us and shown us What God wants from us is a pretty doable thing. It is not beyond our abilities, because that's the whole point of call. God doesn't want perfection. God wants us, all of us. God worked through Peter. What a flawed hero that apostle was. We'll revisit his story many times as we move through Lent and Easter. God worked through Paul, who was a persecutor of the followers of Jesus, and then humbled to become one of the great missionaries and one of the great founders of the faith that became Christianity. God kindled the little embers of faith in the midst of all of those other qualities into a mighty blaze in each of those cases. And what made that possible? 
God saw what was in their hearts and not just what was in their outward selves. God sees what is in our hearts, including our sorrow about our flaws and our mistakes, about the mess that we've sometimes made for ourselves. And God's grace forgives that. Deserving or not, we are treasured by God. We will continue to be treasured by God. We are loved and cared for and lifted up. And knowing that, we are then moved to reconcile our outsides, our everyday life, with our insides, with our faith lives. Sometimes this means small changes, and sometimes it means bigger ones. And at different times, the changes that God is asking each and every one of us to make will be larger or smaller. But in all times, those changes will take humility. They will take us remembering that God is working in us and with us and through us to get right with God. But if we are even the teensiest bit open, and I really want to stress that, if we have even the most half-hearted faith, God can work with it, and God will do it. God is calling us not just to be happy people in and of ourselves. God isn't desiring our happiness so much as our obedience, out of which happiness will grow. But God is calling us to then go out into the world in compassion, to love our neighbors, to care for the last and the least, to understand that everyone we meet is just as flawed as we are, even the people that we don't like, even the people that we don't care to know. God is calling us to live and act from the basis of love and grace, love that forgives, love that transforms, love that will remake the world. So God looks on your heart, God looks on my heart, and God calls each of us to make a difference in the world and then equips us, each in our own way, each with the raw material that we bring to do that. So open your hearts. Discover God's Spirit already at work there and open your life to where that Spirit may lead. I want to close this with a prayer today by the great African-American theologian and preacher Howard Thurman. And so I ask you to join with me in prayer. Gracious God, open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Amen. We will now join together singing hymn number 23, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy.
be seated. We have the benediction followed by the postlude and then a dismissal at the end of the service. And now go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Honor all creation. Love and serve the Lord. Love and serve your neighbor, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit be with us all. Go in peace. Amen. Remind everyone that we next week we'll be having in-person events here at North Church. If you are in the area, a trunk or treat with our dear children, both offering uh, opportunities to give coins for UNICEF to help the world's children, and also receiving whatever we care to give them as far as Halloween treats and an opportunity to celebrate together in our parking lot. Our worship has ended but our time of service has just begun. And so go forth to love and serve the Lord. Amen.